Welcome to this webinar um, hosted by the 21st Century China Center. I'm Molly Roberts. I'm an associate professor of political science at UC San Diego, and I'm also the director of the China Data Lab at the 21st Century China Center. So thank you so much for joining our discussion today. This webinar is recorded and it will be available on our website, which is china.ucsd.edu. So before you get started, just a few preliminary um, things. So please use the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen to submit your questions if you have them. I'll be reading the questions that you submit for our speaker during the Q&A time at the end of the presentation. <clears throat> so today we're delighted to have three panelists with us. First um, is Eileen Guo. Eileen Guo is a senior reporter for features and investigations at MIT Technology Review. Her reporting focuses on how the tech industry and tech policy shapes our world, often entrenching existing systemic injustices and inequalities in the process. Previous to joining the MIT Technology Review, Eileen was a freelance journalist that reported on the ground in, from Afghanistan, China, Central America, and across both urban and rural regions of the United States. Jess Alloy is a freelance journalist based in Boston. Her reporting often focuses on the systemic factors and policies that shape how the various levels of the government and the legal system impact people's lives. And her work draws heavily on data and documents. Before beginning her freelance career, she worked uh, for the USA Today Network's Burlington Free Press in Vermont and New England Center for Investigative Reporting. And we're also really happy to have with us Nelson Dong, who's a senior partner in the Seattle office of Dorsey and Whitney LLP, an international law firm, and heads its national security law group and its co-head of its Asia group. He's an expert on export controls, economic sanctions, national security, and international trade and investment matters. And he is an author and teacher on international technology law issues. Nelson was the White House Fellow and U.S. Department of Justice official in the Carter administration and a federal prosecutor in Boston. He's an adjunct senior fellow at the East-West Center in Honolulu, a director of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations in New York City and the Washington State China Relations Council in Seattle, and an active member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the Committee of 100. Nelson is a graduate of Stanford University and Yale Law School and has served as a trustee at Stanford University. So we'll start with uh, presentations from the panelists, and then I will start the conversation and we'll open it up for Q&A. So welcome Eileen, Jess, and Nelson, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, so we'll get started uh, with a presentation from Eileen and Jess. Thank you so much for having us. We're really happy to be here today on behalf of um, the, the larger reporting team at MIT Technology Review that put together this months long investigation. So um, we'll be talking today about the uh, some of our findings and we really encourage you to take a look at our full story and, and the database itself. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen here. And let me know if that's working. Okay, awesome. Um, so yeah, so we spent about uh, eight months looking into the China Initiative, the Department of Justice's program launched in 2018 to counter um, national, uh, national security threats from China as well as economic espionage. And so before we go into what we found, just some brief background, uh, as I mentioned, it launched in November, 2018. It was the first country specific program from the Department of Justice in the history of, of the department. And it launched with these goals. I'm not gonna read through all of them, but there are 10 goals. And what's interesting is that when we think about the China Initiative today, we really focus on the first two. And that's partly because of the narrative of the Justice Department. So, it, so it's become about uh, identifying, resourcing, and completing the prosecution of trade secret cases, and developing an enforcement strategy on non-traditional collectors, including academics. And so what's, what we wanted to do with our investigation was to really measure the Justice Department's initiative based on its own standards, based on these goals and priorities that it itself set out. 
we thought this was really important because there's been a lot of really great reporting on the individuals that are affected on um, anecdotes really of, of communities of, of researchers. Um, but a lot of times it seems like the criticisms are have been easy for the Justice Department to uh, talk around. And so some of those criticisms that we also wanted to test through data was whether or not there's racial profiling involved in the initiative, um, the chilling effect on science and scientific collaboration, and then the really the key question, whether or not this initiative is working based on the goals and priorities. Is it actually making our country safer? Is it effectively fighting national security threats? Is it stopping economic espionage? And so we published our first main story um, back in December, and um, we published with it a database that Jess is going to talk a little bit more about. Um, and we're continuing to learn more and uh, reporting more. So we've had four stories come out since the start of, our, uh, of the publication. And today we're going to be sharing findings from these four stories. Um, before I turn it over to Jess to go into some of the first findings, I just wanna uh, disclose that MIT Technology Review is owned by MIT, the university, which has a professor that is currently um, scheduled for trial, but we are editorially independent. And another common um, misconception that we have is that we are not academics. This is not a peer reviewed study. This is a work of investigative journalism. And so there's, a, there's going to be limitations on what we're able to do because of that. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Jess. Thank you for, for having me. Um, so you can see this is the, a, a short screenshot of our database. Um, and before we dive too much into the findings, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we created the database and what are some of the limitations. When we set out to try to measure the scope of the China Initiative, as Eileen talked about, there was no repository of information. The only thing we had was a page on the Department of Justice website that listed information about the initiative. They had linked to about 100 press releases on that site. And that was really it. That was the only kind of uh, accounting that we could look at. So we compiled a list of the cases referenced on that site. And while there were about 100 press releases, that doesn't mean there were about 100 cases. Sometimes there were press releases that referred to, there were four or five press releases going to the same case. Sometimes there was only one. Um, so once we compiled that list, we pulled thousands of pages of federal court records and we used that information to build the database. So the information that you see in the database comes uh, directly from court papers. But we knew that press releases referring to at least one defendant, uh, Xing Wang, had been removed. Um, and so when we began looking, there was no press releases on that page linking to anything about MIT professor Gong Chen, uh, who, who even though that had been widely reported as a China Initiative case. So we knew from that that the website was not a complete accounting of every prosecution. And there were also press releases referring to prosecutions that had been brought as far back as 2013, which is about five years before the China Initiative was first announced in November of 2018. So of our 77 cases, 71 came from this initial scrape. We found more cases by combing through public statements made by officials, references in court documents, as well as by talking to activists and academics who are trying, also trying to track the initiative. But the Department of Justice has neither officially defined the China Initiative nor explained what it means to be, what it leads it to label a case as part of the initiative. And when we started looking at our database to find some pattern, well, it all seemed kind of nebulous. Yeah, there were threat theft of trade secrets cases, but there were also um, there was also a case of a man running a turtle smuggling ring and espionage cases with details that seemed straight out of a spy thriller, um, as well as sort of run of the mill immigration uh, smuggling cases. So as far as we could see, the only real pattern that was in, that they involved was that they involved some nexus to China. And what its nexus to China mean, that's still also undefined. So to make this more complicated, um, on November 19th, shortly after we started asking questions uh, to the DOJ, and very shortly before we planned to publish, the DOJ updated this website. Can you go to the next slide? Um, so they updated this website. And they, you can see in this uh, video, there's um, a kind of a before and after. the. Items in yellow were deleted, items in blue were added. Um, 
And so they added two cases, uh, including the Gong Chen case, but they also removed 17 cases. Some of the cases they removed were the older cases. Some were the more nebulous cases like the turtle guy who we were told was included on that list as a mistake. But they also removed cases where charges had been dropped or where a judge had ruled against the prosecution. For example, they removed references to Professor An Ming Hu who had recently been acquitted by a judge after a mistrial. If you've been following the China Initiative for a while, you'll know that An Ming Hu was one of the most high profile China Initiative cases. The situation had been widely reported on. So, to say that he was no longer a China Initiative case was, that was something that, to say that only the cases that had been removed from the website were cases that were not really China Initiative cases was, was something we didn't, uh, we couldn't really trust that. Um, I and mean, so in addition to that, we were faced with the problem of how to categorize these cases, especially um, the cases that involved academics, which is one of the uh, things we really wanted to look at. The in our database, we've, we've, we've created several categories. Um, and obviously the Department of Justice did not pre-categorize them for us. Uh, so we decided to look at them through, um, so for example, we decided to look, we looked at, we decided to categorize cases by the nature of the alleged offense. So instead of looking at whether the defendant was an academic, we looked at whether they were accused of a research integrity issue. And by research integrity, we mean cases against mostly academics, but for things like failing to disclose foreign affiliations on grant applications or when filling out ethics forms. Um, and these academics face charges like making false statements and wire fraud and not uh, economic espionage or theft and trade secrets cases. But in public statements, prosecutors often at times frame these people as being disloyal to the United States or accuse them of stealing technology, even though that's not what was charged. So instead of looking at um, the profession, we decided to look just at what the Department of Justice was alleging. So one of the limitations of this data is that there may be cases that we could have included, more cases. And, and if you know of any, please feel free to reach out. Um, and then some critics have argued that we included cases that weren't really China initiative cases, like the turtle smuggler. And other outlets or other and other academics, they may choose to categorize cases differently. They may say um, that a case that we they may look at the professions of the people involved instead of looking at the uh, what was actually alleged. But we've decided, the way that we decided to, to handle this was that the best way is to be very transparent. Um, we have an entire story dedicated to our methodology that published alongside our first article, which is hopefully linked. Uh, and if you're interested in a more detailed breakdown of how we categorize cases, as well as how we determine things like ethnicity, I'd, I'd point you there. Uh, and of course, uh, the database is, publicly available and so you can look through it yourself uh, and we encourage you to do so. So what did we find? Oh, let's go to the next slide. So what did we find? Go to the next slide again. Um, we, we found that a lot of the cases had little or no obvious connection um, to, to national security and the theft of, of trade secrets. Um, and it, looking at the whole, all of the 77 cases, only 19 of them examined, uh, will be examined, included charges under the Economic Espionage Act, which covers both theft of trade secrets and economic espionage. And only eight of those 19 cited economic espionage, which was a harder uh, charge for prosecutors to, to bring because they need to show that the theft of trade secrets benefited another country. And remember, if you remember the uh, goals that I talked about, that was one of the major goals of the China Initiative. But instead we saw that the DOJ was increasingly focused on researchers. And by 2020, research integrity cases, which again are things like failing to disclose foreign affiliations on a form, um, made up about half of all the China Initiative prosecutions. The all, they made up about half of all China Initiative prosecutions that were opened. Uh, and a significant number of these cases, eight out of the 23 have actually been dropped by the prosecution or ended in an acquittal. And keep in mind that the federal criminal system, over 90% of cases ended with the defendant pleading guilty. So most cases in the federal system, most cases should be ending with a, a guilty plea. Um, let me go forward again. Uh, so we were also surprised to see that um, only about a quarter of the people and institutions charged had actually been convicted. And this was on December 1st when we published the story. Since then, the Harvard professor, Charles Lieber, was found guilty 
at trial and a former Monsanto scientist has pleaded guilty to economic espionage. And I haven't run the percentages again, so it may be uh, not quite a, a quarter, but what's interesting is that nearly half of the defendants with pending charges against them have never seen the inside of an American courtroom. So those cases may be pending forever. Um, and China does not have extradition treaties with the United States, so th those are uh, hard to prosecute. And uh, Eileen will continue with some more of our findings. Sorry, I had to give myself a second to unmute. So um, I'm going to go over just two of the findings that we had under who's being charged. And, and I think these are um, some of the biggest questions that we have about the China Initiative. Oops. Uh, so the first one is trying to address this question of is there racial profiling in the initiative? And so what we found is that of the 148 individuals that were charged under the China Initiative, 130 of them were of Chinese heritage. That's almost 90%, which is a very large number. By itself, this doesn't prove uh, racial profiling, which um, requires some demonstration of intent. And that's one of the big arguments that the department has made in terms of uh, answering this question of whether or not they are being discriminatory. They further say that what they're really looking for and what they're prosecuting is conduct. They don't care about the race of the individual that is, uh, is, is the target of their prosecution. But the interesting thing is that in those thousands of pages of court rec records that we looked at, we found multiple instances where the conduct was really not as suspicious or criminal uh, as, as would be suggested. So it could be traveling to China. In several cases, it was um, there were professors that traveled to China on behalf of the universities for which they worked. Um, and there were other cases where individuals were going back to see family. And so when you look at that, this, this distinction between conduct and being of Chinese heritage and doing things that if you are a immigrant uh, going back to see your family, it becomes a little bit fuzzier. The other piece that's really interesting to keep in mind is that profiling and bias doesn't just happen at the prosecution stage, which is part of what the DOJ has been arguing. It also can happen at the investigatory stage. And that came out a little bit in the Charles Lieber trial um, where the professor was found guilty of six charges. But we were really intrigued when on the fifth day in an exchange between the defense and a, a government investigator, the investigator said that one of the reasons that Charles Lieber was under suspicion was because he had too many Chinese students in his laboratory. So again, if we're talking about conduct and part of the conduct is having Chinese students in your laboratory, and then the Chinese students are considered suspicious because they're Chinese, that raises additional questions about what exactly are we talking about when we're talking about conduct. And that's an avenue of, of investigation that we're still pursuing. And, and so the other thing that is interesting about the Charles Lieber trial that that tells us is that maybe they can, the DOJ is correct in saying that they are not prosecuting based on the defendant's race, but if they're racially profiling Chinese students that work for the defendant, again, that raises questions about what exactly we're talking about. The second piece that I wanna mention is this question of uh, the thousand, or sorry, talent recruitment plans like the Thousand Talents Program. Our, our findings showed that 19 of 77 of the China Initiative cases did include some allegation of uh, talent plan involvement. And this is just in the court records. There have been a couple of other cases that have had um, additional documents come up where there is an argument now about Thousand Talents and other programs and, and whether or not they, they participated in them. And of course, it's not illegal to participate in these talent plans. Um, so it's, it's a, uh, a, an additional question that's raised again about what are we talking about when we're talking about conduct and why is it that these talent programs um, are, are leading to suspicion? And finally, what's next for the China Initiative? I'll turn that back to Jess. So 
this China initiative was is often described as a Trump era uh, initiative, and it was indeed started under the Trump administration. Um, it was announced by Jeff Sessions, but we have seen, and we can see the breakdown in the next slide, um, that prosecutions have been continuing under uh, the Biden administration. Um, there were six cases brought uh, last year. Um, half of them were research integrity cases, and of course, we you know there are. Our likely cases that we may have not found in our in our investigations. And even in the cases where they were brought under Trump, the attorneys, the US attorneys are continuing to, to prosecute um, a lot of these cases. So we'll continue to kind of follow and see if there's any change in how the Biden administration approaches this. But there's also, um, and in the next slide you can see a little bit um, of the policy and the law around research security especially is still developing. Um, they, uh, earlier this month, the um, Office of Science and Technology Policy came out with um, this guidance for implementing a research security, um, a, a research security memo that had been signed by Trump. And it, claim, it, it it's the idea of it is to um, standardize across the different federal agencies that make grants, like the NIH and NSF, uh, what the disclosure requirements are, how they actually disclose it and uh, you know, who, who has to disclose, which has been a question in some of these cases. Um, and, but in, other, in another uh, piece of legislation that's pending is the United States Innovation and Com Competition Act, um, which is currently, it passed the Senate as you can see there, and it is currently in the House. And it's a pretty, or it's currently in a conference between the two branches of government where they're working out sort of the differences. So we'll see what it ends up being in it. And it's a really sweeping bill um, that includes everything from um, more funding for chip makers. Uh, but one of the things that, that this, the, this version does do is say that you cannot be part of a talent program if you and get, um, and get federal funding. So that would, so we'll, we'll be continuing to follow to see uh, what these evolving policy and law, how, and what impact they have on um, academic institutions. And uh, that's, Something that you know, hopefully, um, we'll we'll be able to to dive into a little bit more. And so, and one more quick thing in the last slide, uh, as Eileen said, we'll be continuing to report on some of this. And so, if you want to reach out to us, um, you can email either Eileen or I or find us on Twitter. But you can also reach out to tips at technologyreview.com. And uh, that's about it for us. Thank you so much for listening. Hey. Thank you so much, Eileen and Jess, for your presentation and extensive data collection that's helping us better understand this initiative. Um, one of the things that struck me in your analysis is that there are many of these cases that are still pending with very little activity since indictment. Can you give a sense of why these cases are delayed? And is this unusual if we compare it to other, other cases that are brought by the Department of Justice? So for the most part, these are um, cases where the defendants are not in the United States. Um, and they have to, they, they can't be brought to the, to the courthouse in a ring. Um, it, it's hard to compare it with other cases because, you know, this is a, an internationally focused initiative. Um, and so some of these cases, for example, the, the cases brought against um, hackers that are sponsored by the Chinese Ministry of State Security, you know, we wouldn't necessarily expect to see them be brought to the United States. Um, but the indictments may serve other purposes. They may be, you know, a, a diplomatic tool or, or something like that. But most, for most part, it's because uh, the, the the defendants are just not here. I see. So this is more less in the research integrity cases and more in these other sort of um, cases uh, with international defendants. Okay. Yeah, I, just, yeah. I just want to add to that. I, I think it's an important to note also that, um, especially with the cases of the hackers, which are legitimately, you know, stealing um, American data and targeting um, American infrastructure and companies, these have really big impacts and they are not being brought, again, for legitimate reasons, but I think it's, it's important to keep in context the cases that are being brought against academics within that, that broader framework. 
Thanks so much for uh, for the clarification. Um, so let's turn to Nelson. Um, Nelson, your own legal work regularly involves counseling, um, in-house legal counsel, basically, and, and, and university administrators across the country. Could you share with us how the China Initiative has affected American research universities and their administrators, faculty, and students? And what is it, has it been like to sort of be on the ground, as it were, between such universities and their local FBI field offices and U.S. attorney offices? Nelson, to you. Sure. Thank you, Molly. And, and I want to first express my deep appreciation for the incredible uh, research and investigative reporting that, that Eileen and Jess and their teammates have done. This is a really difficult area to try to explain, and they've done it very thoroughly and very clearly. So it's a, it's a great job, and hats off to, to both of you and your colleagues. Um, on the ground, as it were, across the country, most research universities in this country have been dealing not just with the China Initiative, but also other parts of the federal uh, research establishment, particularly agencies that provide the bulk of research funding, such as the NIH, the NSF, DARPA, uh, and other such agencies. So those agencies have been reaching out now for several years, probably the, the the, the seminal document was the Dear Colleagues letter that came from Dr. Francis Collins, who's the director of the National Institutes of Health, uh, urging universities to be much more thoughtful about research integrity and research security and focusing on disclosures of conflicts of interest and conflicts of commitment, um, protecting the security of peer review of either journal articles or proposals for funding. Um, which contain a lot of sensitive, not necessarily proprietary, but sensitive and confidential academic information that PIs are submitting in anticipation of funding. And so they're outlining their lines of investigation and why their research is important, how it would contribute to advancement of the art or science in their field, and so on. And so these kinds of letters preceded the China Initiative and were already kind of out there in an effort to ensure that federal research dollars were being properly spent and that people were dealing fairly and squarely. Um, there was a lot of concern uh, behind Dr. Collins' letter and similar letters from NSF, the Department of Energy, and other agencies about um, a practice that's known colloquially in higher education as double dipping. Uh, double dipping consists of having two jobs, basically, and two incomes, uh, a second uh, appointment in a different university in a different country. And sometimes this would be disclosed to the US institution that was the regular American employer, and sometimes not so much. And so there was a concern that institutions themselves were not being dealt with fairly, and never mind the federal funding. And so research institutions already had, for the most part, conflict of interest and conflict of commitment policies. These vary from institution to institution, but almost all schools have had them for a number of years. They are uh, spottily enforced. They are non-uniformly enforced. They are carried out in a very decentralized manner for the most part. Um, and so the, the compliance landscape, shall we say, was very uneven. So you put on top of that the China Initiative and U.S. attorneys' offices around the country and FBI field offices around the country have all been encouraged to have special designated people who work on these national security cases and who have been urged to contact the compliance staff of universities within the territory that they're responsible for law enforcement. Um, so for instance, here in Seattle where I work, it's the Western District of Washington State. And so the FBI field office in Seattle, US Attorney's Office in Seattle have reached out in various ways to different parts of the universities across this part of Washington state and have tried to alert them and inform them um, as is called out in the fact sheet for the China Initiative about the risk that, that faced them 
from overseas and to try to encourage them to police themselves, to work out a more uniform training and more consistent training in disclosures of conflicts of commitment and conflicts of interest, and then to feed that improved disclosure uh, into the way that federal grant applications are handled, because those have to be signed off both by the PI and by the institution ordinarily when those applications go in. So the idea is that by policing the internal affairs of universities better, they will end up creating better compliance with federal disclosure rules. Within the university community, there's really no objection to making sure that such disclosures happen well. Most institutions, unfortunately, happen to be sort of under-resourced in this area. And it is a question of how much emphasis from higher management within academia is placed upon enforcing these policies for disclosure and checking out the forms and auditing the forms, ensuring that they're current and up to date, because by and large, PIs are very busy people. They have many, many different pieces of paper to fill out and file all the time. And they may not always intentionally be behind, but they can actually be just fall behind because of the press of work and, and so forth. And so it's not always that they're trying to conceal these things from anyone, but they become overlooked or because the agencies themselves have such disparate uh, requirements for disclosure. And every agency has a different form and a different set of requirements that if you're used to getting all your funding from agency A and you suddenly apply for something from agency B with a whole new set of requirements and a whole new set of forms, they may think that the way they did agency A's disclosures will also meet the requirements of agency B, but it doesn't really in fact work out that way. And so there, there ends up being a shortfall. Um, that's part of the reason, as Jess pointed out a moment ago, that NSPM 33, this new direction that just came out from the government, is striving to regularize and harmonize and standardize these agency requirements because at the end of the day, a federal dollar is a federal dollar. And so there's no particular uh, rational policy reason that every agency should have its own form. Every agency should say, you have to declare this is a conflict of interest, but this is not, you know, that, that kind of variation almost sets people up to fail both at the institutional level as well as at the PI level, because the more non-uniformity you have, the more possibility of misunderstanding or innocent mistakes. And so the whole you know, at that end of the pipeline is that by squaring up these requirements, it'll be easier for institutions to comply. And hopefully there'll be more uniform training coming out of the government and uniform interpretations so that th this will eventually sort of sell itself out. And there will be fewer of these, uh, at least mistakes that are being made you know, at the PI and even at the institutional level. So that, that's kind of a long-winded way of addressing it, but it's not just the China Initiative on the ground. It's really much more this research administration process that is being uh, looked at. And the FBI and the, and the U.S. attorneys are in support of that, but they're not really where academic administrators and in-house counsel spend the bulk of their time. Great. That is that provides a really good background to and also on the ground look to what's been going on in within the university. Um, <clears throat> just as a broader question uh, for Nelson, the China Initiative is you know, not the only federal program that's been focused on sort of modifying U.S.-China relationships in regard to U.S. national and economic security. Can you help us sort of contextualize the China Initiative and place it within sort of the wide range of other government actions that have affected the U.S.-China relationship in recent years? Sure. And many of these also, these changes also affect universities in their own way, uh, but they receive sort of less headline attention. So if you step back, probably going back at least as far as the Obama administration, but certainly 
it, during the, the, the Trump administration and, and as recently as the Biden administration, the White House has generally had a, a strategic view of China for several decades, especially after the great opening in China beginning in 1979 under Deng Xiaoping. There was an era of what um, some of the, the major commentators in this field have called the great opening. And there's been a period of constructive engagement and that pertained to the business community, that pertained to the academic community. And so whereas, you know, before the 1970s, there was relatively little contact. Contact now has grown massively over the, 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 the years since 79. Um, for instance, in the area of universities, roughly one in every four foreign graduate students or undergraduates in the United States comes to, the, to America from China. I mean, that's a huge swing. Uh, demographically, if you're to look at, at the, what the effect that that has on a U.S. higher education. And many uh, programs have a very high per percentage of enrollees, particularly in the STEM fields from China or from India, uh, which constitutes about another quarter of the input for, for students in those STEM programs. So what this has meant is that the U.S. government has been concerned about the whole technological spectrum, and there have been different approaches launched by different agencies beyond the Justice Department in an effort to sort of get more control over this interface involving science and technology between the two countries. The most visible examples are in the field of U.S. export controls. Over the last uh, five or six years, um, there have been celebrated cases like the ZTE and Huawei cases in which the U.S. government has cut off the right of those companies to acquire U.S. goods and services and U.S. technology by placing those companies and their subsidiaries on something called the entity list, which is maintained by the Bureau of Industry and Security at the Commerce Department. <clears throat> we now have a new requirement under the National Defense Authorization Act of 1999 called the Section 1237 or 1237 list, which is supposed to reveal to the American public and the American business community companies that are linked to the People's Liberation Army and the Chinese military industrial complex. Uh, last year, the Treasury Department got into the game as well, and now they have something called the Non-Specially Designated Nationals Chinese Military Industrial Complex Companies List, uh, which is a, quite a mouthful. And that's supposed to target companies that supply and support either the PLA or Chinese security forces, such as those that are operating in Xinjiang, uh, relative to the Uyghur and other Muslim minority populations in that province. And so as you pivot from agency to agency to agency across the federal government, we have seen more and more efforts to limit and control and regulate the flow of American technology to China. There's also a flip side. Now more and more there are concerns about the inflow of Chinese technology into the United States and how that technology could somehow impact national security and national defense. So uh, examples of those are the effort initially during the Trump administration to regulate WeChat and TikTok use in the United States. Um, we now have uh, certain types of drones that are off limits to be procured by federal agencies, including the FBI, among others, or the US military because the drones are made in China for fear that there may be embedded software or hardware weaknesses or Trojan horses inside those products. Um, there's a whole new regulatory structure called the Information Communications Technology Services Infrastructure that's being administered by the Commerce Department to preclude the importation of ICTS products such as uh, cell phones and so forth. You saw it in the FCC's 
curtailment of the ability of China Mobile to operate its cell phones in the United States. And so you just go right down the line and there's more and more of this regulation. And inevitably these things also touch American universities and academic research. Um, the, the easiest case to, in point is to go back to that entity list from the Commerce Department and see that uh, between the entity list and the unverified list of the Commerce Department, there are now, you know, probably approaching a hundred different Chinese universities and institutes and academies that have been named to these export control lists that are off limits to Americans to send things to. There are varying degrees of, of control, but it makes it very, very problematic for American universities and PIs working in those universities if they're not also keeping an eye on those lists and those people that have been barred from receiving US technology because the universities in the US and the PIs in the US can inadvertently get tangled up in those things. And they're not used to thinking of not being able to work with scholars in these other institutions, particularly if they have the name university or the name institute or the name academy in their names. They treat them all the same, but the US government does not. Fascinating. Thanks so much um, for putting that in context, putting this whole um, initiative in context. Really appreciate that. Um, so um, in our last uh, 15 minutes here, we're going to move um, to the Q&A. I encourage members of the audience, please use the Q&A box to submit your questions. Um, and then I will read out the question and the name of the questioner, um, and we can answer those. Um, so the first question is um, coming from Peter Michelson, and I, I think this is directed uh, to Jess and I Eileen, um, but also Nelson, feel free to jump in. Um, uh, so the question is, of the China initiative cases that end with a guilty plea, is that primarily because of a plea bargain and guilty pleas um, uh, for or the least serious charge? So, um, so how does the, how does the, how does, tell us more about the cases that end with a guilty plea. Sure. Um, there are uh, definitely examples of cases where uh, someone pled guilty or pleaded guilty to a lesser charge. Um, and we know that that's, that's pretty common across the justice system as a whole. Uh, and that prosecutors will say, you know, you can take your chance at trial or you can take this lesser, uh, this lesser sentence or this lesser charge. And we've seen in some of the uh, documents I reviewed included emails between um, prosecutors and defense attorneys say, saying, take a plea bargain now and we won't add more charges but if you if you don't we might add charges um, but there are also a lot of reasons why people uh, plead guilty and we have seen cases where there's one charge um, or they plead guilty to all of them and you know there's there's reasons why people it, it's, it's very expensive to defend yourself in a, a criminal investigation um, and it's very stressful it's a sometimes a very long process and so there are a lot of reasons why people say, you know, maybe they, they just want this to, to be over and they don't want to fight in court. Um, and, it, you know, it, it's like I said, in the federal court system, you know, obviously it fluctuates from year to year. But generally we see about 90 percent of cases ended up a, 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 a plea bargain. So it, it's there are a lot of reasons why that happens. Great, thanks uh, for that answer. Um, so the next uh, question is directed at Nelson. Uh, this is from Gregory Moffat. Um, does Nelson have concerns with respect to the anticipated DARPA risk grid that is to be used to evaluate potential undue foreign influence with respect to researchers who have submitted proposals to DARPA? Um, the basis upon which the evaluation of risk is to be made seems to lack transparency. Nelson, uh, can you comment on that? I don't have direct experience with that DARPA risk matrix yet. Um, I'm sure I will be soon. I know what it is. And I think there are concerns about it and also how it will be used as a model for the NSPM 33 uh, rollout to the extent that it's adopted as sort of the, the model by which other agencies also ask scholars to make disclosures and so forth. So I think it's going to take some time for that to shake out. The, the process has been announced through the NSPM 33 guidance document that uh, 
Jess and, I, uh, and uh, Eileen referred to earlier in this program, calls for the different agencies to engage with their respective constituencies to develop specific forms and protocols for these disclosures to happen. All of the major academic scholarly organizations like the AAU and OECO and others are already heavily engaged in talking with the government about how these different agencies are gonna approach this process. So my guess is uh, the jury is quite a long ways out on the DARPA risk matrix, and there'll be lots of feedback going in about whether that is or isn't a, a good thing and is or isn't sufficiently transparent from the standpoint of the investigators and the institutions. It's just way too early to know whether that will be fixed in stone eventually uh, or whether it'll be moved as a result of all these you know, many, many conversations yet to be had. Great, thank you, Nelson. Um, so the next question is from David Lebutz. Um, Given that China's use of non-traditional intelligence collectors is codified in Chinese law, Article 14 of China's 2017 National Intelligence Law, isn't it legitimate for the FBI to see the presence of Chinese nationals in sensitive research projects at American universities as suspicious? Um, does anyone want to comment on that? I can take that. Um... That is, uh, I guess, one of the key questions that's, um, and, and one of the things that the Justice Department has argued is that uh, because China is a country primarily of one ethnicity, that it is natural for uh, Chinese heritage individuals to be uh, more likely to be targeted as, as intelligence collectors. But I would say that it, no, it's not legitimate uh, for the FBI to, to see the presence alone of Chinese um, nationals to, to be a problem because it's uh, racial profiling is not something that we are allowed to engage in. So the laws that we should be most concerned with in the United States are, are US laws and US federal uh, prosecuting guidelines. Uh, I also just wanna add briefly to that. You know, you said um, in sensitive projects, and in many of these research integrity cases, it was explicitly said that these were not particularly sensitive projects. Um, there were cases of, you know, someone who was doing an autoimmune disease research. Uh, so I think, and oftentimes in the case itself, it, it came out that, you know, that the, they were not dealing with anything that anyone considered suspicious or sensitive. And so I think that's also important to, to note. Yeah, if I can add one further sort of historical or contextual note, the United States has long had a system of separating out research funding that it deemed particularly sensitive. And there are basically two safeguards that American funding agencies can impose. First, at the highest level, is that if it's truly sensitive, it can be made classified. And there are only a handful of American universities that are prepared to do classified research on their campuses. Uh, schools like MIT and Lincoln Labs certainly is one place where that's done. Um, the, uh, the, um, the University of Washington, where I work here in, in Seattle, has such a lab. Um, Johns Hopkins has such a lab. A number of other universities have engaged in classified research. And so in that instance, the, the government itself, right from the get-go, has the ability to simply preclude all foreign nationals regardless of ethnicity, from participating and requiring that only US citizens work on those projects and that they have individual security clearances to do so. Then on top of that, even in the broader university, there are funding mechanisms available to these agencies that simply say no foreign nationals can be placed on this project. Uh, NASA, for instance, has long had such a clause in regard to its funding to university researchers relative to China specifically. And so if the agency feels it's sensitive and they really don't want Chinese to work on it, they simply say so at the front end of the process, university and the PI sign up for that and that's the bargain. But the problem as Eileen was just ad addressing a moment ago is when you say there are not classified research, it's not 
no foreigners allowed research. It's just generic, ordinary funded research, you know, about corn or about rice or about thousands of other things that are studied. Then why suddenly do you have this security concern because there are Chinese graduate students or postdocs working in the funded lab? <clears throat> that is the issue that raises the racial profiling concern so starkly, and particularly when you see the numbers that Eileen and Jess have found in their study. And just final thing to add to that that I think is really important is that when you are excluding a um, excluding from research projects, that is very different from the FBI investigating someone for criminal wrongdoing on the basis of of the presence of a particular race in a lab. Thanks um, to all of you for um, your answers. Um, okay, so the next question is from uh, Chunwei Xu. Um, do, do, does the DOJ apologize or compensate people who are wrongly charged? That's an, <laughs> that's an excellent <laughs> question. Um, so there have been cases where judges have spoken to um, what they feel to, to not have been the best case. And we we had we saw that with the On Ming Hu case. Um, but no, there is there's no compensation. Um, there are indiv and the question is, does the DOJ compensate? So that that's just that's the answer. There is none. Um, there are cases in the past where individuals are can file lawsuits um, if they believe that it was a malicious prosecution, um, and there are cases where the universities continue to support uh, academics by placing them on paid leave, for example, or in the case of Gong Chen again at MIT, um, paying for his legal fees. But that's that's a little bit different from what you're asking about. All right, so I'll move to the next question um, from Michael Davidson. Um, so this is a question for Eileen and Jess. Um, we know the recent guidelines on disclosures, um, NSPM 33, just specifies minimum disclosures, but fails to indicate all of the institutional co connections that the federal government would see as problematic. Can we glean anything from the cases or public statements about how much connection to China is too much? It's a really, really good question. Um, and you know, I think that that is something that we'll have to kind of see going forward. Uh, like Eileen had said earlier, sometimes the connection to China they're talking about is going to China, um, having Chinese students in their lab, or you know, and some of these trips are university-sponsored trips to recruit um, students. So, yeah, I think that's something that will that you know there is it is not there's no clear. Um, in the cases, kind of, here's where the line is. I mean, I think that's something that universities are going to have to really reckon with, um, and academics are going to really have to reckon with, especially as one of the things that the um, new guidance encourages is sort of retroactive disclosures, saying, you know, oh, maybe I applied for this grant and I didn't fully disclose, but let me disclose now. And at the same time, you know, that might be hard for some people to be willing to do that, considering sort of what, what's been going on, what's happened. Um, and so I think we'll now you'll have to see going forward if they can kind of clearly define like what where the line is. They do talk about something called um, like conflicts of interest and con conflicts of commitment as being sort of the guidance for what's problematic is when you start to have so many um, commitments to, to a Chinese university that you can't fulfill your commitments to a United States university. But again, those are still, you know, there's a lot of room for interpretation there, I think. If, if I can add just a, a footnote to, to what Jess just said, um, the NSPM 33 guidance that was just issued uh, this month by the Office of Science and Technology Policy does envision that there will be tier one covered individuals and tier two covered individuals by way of the degree and amount of disclosure required. The, the difference primarily is that tier one disclosures are people who are actually receiving funding. And so they're required to provide more disclosure than tier two, who are people who are assigned to serve on say, peer review panels for grant applications and whom say the NIH may circulate blind. Here's an application for funding from scholar X 
uh, please tell me what you think of this proposal and whether we ought to fund it or not. And so those people have a different level of, and a lesser level based on the design of, of NSPM 33 guidance um, to disclose somewhat less. In addition, there is still an ongoing debate between the different agencies because some agencies currently require disclosures of consultancies and others do not. And so that has yet to be worked out among all the agencies. My guess is at the end of this process, that consultancies probably will become universally disclosable, you know, that they'll err on the side of, of caution, you know, for the government's sake and for the institution and PI's sake, you know, they'll just make it more disclosure rather than less. And so eventually this will all kind of shake itself out. Great, so I have um, one additional question. So um, the one thing that I heard um, that, that you said, Nelson, is you know in the past that the requirements for disclosures were sort of very unevenly enforced and sometimes sort of poorly defined. Obviously there's some confusion about um, what needed to be disclosed at times. Um, do we see these research integrity cases for researchers working with other countries or just with China? I mean, if we, if, if we, um, you know, it seems like we would expect to see lapses in compliance across all types of collaborations, not just um, with uh, researchers working with China. I'm not aware of any empirical studies such as the ones that Eileen and Jess have just run. They might know if there have been other nationalities done this way. So there are, um, you know, we did come across a few cases where there was some connection to, to Russia or Iran, which are also kind of countries of concern, according to the United States government. But one thing that did is that, and, and while you know we haven't done the empirical study to say, here's how many are in a different country, um, we did look at some of the, for example, the um, NIH, the National Institutes of Health, talked about their investigations into um, researchers who had foreign influences and they were concerned. And I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but I think something like, um, something in the high 80s or even in their low 90s were 90 percentage, 90, 92, 93% um, were, China was the country of concern in, in, in like the vast majority of those cases. Um, and most of those, of course, never ended up becoming criminal charges, um, but that they are people who, they, the, the NIH reached out to their institutions and you know expressed concerns, and some of them lost their jobs uh, based based on this. And um, most of them, again, the, the majority of them were of Asian descent, and um, China was the country of concern in for most of them. So, which tells us that you know that that these are that China is sort of a, a that a lot of these cases are going to be focused on China, and that you know we're not. I wouldn't expect to see the same number of cases necessarily against um, Iran or Russia. You know, one feature of these talent program cases has been um, the, the finding in, in a number of these instances where the Chinese universities or the talent program has a contract attached to it, which um, has a confidentiality clause that they may not disclose their second employment to American officials or American institutions of higher education. Um, it's not self-evident why such a clause is necessary, but it does add to the perception that these things are not above board, you know, when they're not allowed to, to tell their own employer in the United States that they have a second job, especially when the employer in the United States has a policy that you're supposed to disclose any moonlighting or other engagements that would constitute a conflict of commitment or a conflict of interest like that. Um, so there's a very interesting study that was released in 2020 uh, by SICE. I, I believe, uh, don't quote me on this, but I think the lead scholars name was Swag, and it's a very thoughtful analysis of the Chinese talent programs and the history of them, and does a very thorough empirical job of why some of the features in these programs actually 
seem conducive to setting up investigators in the United States who are Chinese for being targeted this way because they end up falling prey to some of the financial incentives in these programs that are problematic at best. Um, so I just want to add, sorry, I did look up the the exact numbers and um, for the NIH, and so in as of October fifteenth, twenty twenty one, um, they had investigated uh, the NIH had investigated about uh, two hundred twenty six scientists, and China was the country of concern in ninety one of those ninety one percent of those cases, so two hundred six cases. Um, so that's you know suggests pretty strongly that. China kind of dominates this research integrity, research security question. Thanks. I realize there's one last question in chat that I didn't um, address. So if, if you have time, I'll, I'll just um, ask that very last question. Um, this is from Maria Abram Abramson. Um, why is the DOJ initiative being characterized as racial profiling as it seems that the focus is on nationality, not race? If this is prohibited, it seems we can never acknowledge that a given country's um, country's interests are largely adverse to the US. Um, would you guys want to address that? Sure. Um, I think there's two points there that are important to keep in mind. Um, according to uh, federal prosecuting guidelines, both uh, race and national origin are actually um, areas that are that are protected. So you are not able to say that someone is guilty just based on or to investigate just based on either race or national origin. But that said, um, our, our research did find that while 88% of individuals charged were of Chinese heritage, meaning they can be of any nationality or citizenship, um, 40 American citizens were charged as well. And so that's why when people are concerned about racial profiling, they are more concerned about racial profiling as opposed to national origin profiling. And several of these research integrity cases um, were of professors who were American citizens. Um, and they were of Chinese nationality, Chinese heritage, but they were um, American citizens. And the pattern there, you know, predates the China Initiative. I mean. Dr. Xi's case at Temple University, for instance, you know, in Philadelphia, you know, which was during the Obama administration, you know, predated the uh, the initiative by several years, and yet involved an American citizen, a naturalized American citizen who was a native, originally born and raised and educated in China. Um, so that's a further, you know, case of the kind that Eileen was talking about, where, you know, it's not a matter of nationality per se, you know, it does appear to be racial. Great, well, our um, time is up. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, this webinar will be available in the next few days on our website, again, china.ucsd.edu. And um, please join us um, for upcoming um, events um, that you'll see um, here um, uh, just as we close. Um, so thank you so much and uh, see you next time. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you again for the honor. Thank you. You guys really have um, enlightened us with uh, with your your uh, talks and your comments. <laughs>